Uh, we are very happy to have today Chris Paredes from Delta Tech. Chris is an associate professor at the TW Woodrow School of Mechanical Engineering, and he's the associate director of the new center they started there uh, with the name of Model Based Systems Engineering Center. Um, he uh, got his uh, PhD from Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, Chris is very active in systems, decision making, control, and he has been very, very active in uh, the object management group, especially the one of the key things in the integration between system management and Modelica. He, is on, he was on the finalization task force of the system health Modelica transformation specification. Uh, he serves as associate for the general mechanical design. He was the chair of the SME Computers and Information Engineering Division in 2007-2008. He has received several awards, notably two of them are for excellence in education. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, what I'd like to do today is give you a little bit of an overview of some of the research that we're doing uh, at Georgia Tech in the area of model-based systems engineering, specifically within my group, but frame it a little bit more broadly. Now, before I go into any details, I just wanted to get a quick sense for how we, where we are as a group here. I don't need to go over the details of SysML, I assume, or, or most of the people are familiar with SysML. Is that a fair assumption? Yeah, they're yes. Yes, so then I, I will skip through that very quickly. I included the slides just in case, but I'll skip through those very quickly. Uh, what I'd like to do still is, is give you, start off with my perspective on model-based systems engineering. Why, why is it important? What, is, uh, what do I mean by model-based systems engineering? Now I'll skip over the systems modeling language and focus primarily on some of the work that we're doing that involves model transformation as a key capability that goes well with model-based systems engineering, and then finally how we use model, these model transformations to support uh, system architecture exploration. So let's see, model-based systems engineering. If we look at, at complex systems these days, then the key feature, I think, in the, in the development of such systems is that they are so complex that there is no way that one single person can possibly uh, uh, solve the development of such, such systems. It requires that many different stakeholders come together, people with different expertise, bring that expertise and share that with each other in order to solve these complex problems. In current practice, at the systems level, at the systems engineering level, much of that integration of these different types of knowledge occurs through the sharing of documents still. And uh, we have, you know, maybe a requirements documents, we have uh, process management plans, and so on and so forth. Different documents that people share with each other. And uh, that, that's a, a significant problem. Because these problems, these documents, really carry all kinds of implicit dependencies between them. In one requirement, it may list a certain number uh, in terms of, I don't know, a certain time that, that needs to be met. And uh, that same number may occur in a variety of other documents. If the number changes, it becomes an incredible headache to go and trace back all of the other occurrences of that same number in these other documents. So there we re very quickly reach a ceiling at which maintaining the dependencies between these documents becomes virtually impossible. All of a systems engineering, I think, is that the approach where we are replacing these documents with an integrated system model and provide the stakeholders with an opportunity to, it provides these different stakeholders with an opportunity to integrate with one single system model. It doesn't necessarily mean that they all need to speak the same exact language. There is different views of that system model that are customized to the individual stakeholders. But the dependencies between these views are resolved because they all are extracted from the same underlying repository, the same underlying system model. Uh, and uh, now this is the approach that people are currently developing within the model-based systems engineering community, uh, an approach that is supported by, for instance, the system L language, the system modeling language. And, uh, yeah, so let's, let's take a closer look at what that system model really uh, incorporates. Uh, it's going to be an integrated system model 
that addresses all of the different aspects that we encounter in the systems engineering development process. That starts, of course, with uh, requirements that drive the whole process. It allows us to represent the structure of the system. Uh, for instance, here for a, for a vehicle, we, we could uh, represent the decomposition of the vehicle structure in terms of engine, transmission, and driveline, physical architecture of the system. It also includes behavior or functional representations of that system, where we look at a, at a higher level of abstraction and what are the different types of functions that the system must uh, uh, perform and in which order do these, these different functions occur and so on and so forth. And then, of course, once we have a representation of the physical architecture of the system, we also want to predict what the performance is of these different uh, uh, physical architectures. That looks, for instance, at uh, a dynamic performance in, in which we describe how the system state evolves over time. But there's a variety of different types of performance characteristics, going from mass, cost, manufacturing, manufacturability, reliability. All of these ultimately need to be brought together in order to make good trade-offs at the system level. The goal here within model-based systems engineering is to have formal, complete, and semantically rich models that cover all of these different aspects of uh, the systems engineering uh, problem. Okay. Now, uh, you could say one advantage that I already pointed out is that the different stakeholders uh, can share the, their knowledge in an integrated fashion. But there's also a variety of other uh, benefits that actually result from that. Uh, improved communication. The communication, especially when we're dealing with very diverse stakeholders, can be quite a challenge. And if we work with more formal models, then these communications will be less ambiguous uh, and more consistent. There's less opportunity for having uh, discrepancies between the different types of information that is being used by the different stakeholders. Secondly, uh, we have improved complexity management. Uh, we can implement traceability, meaning that as a requirement changes, we can trace through all of the other types of representation of the system and identify which other information needs to be uh, updated and maybe reconsidered. We can work in different levels of abstraction and decompose the system more easily. So these are other uh, examples of, of what a model-based approach will allow you to do. Finally, uh, there's an improved design quality involved that as we work with more formal representations of the system, we can improve both the efficiency and the effectiveness of the design space exploration. We can automate some of the more mundane tasks and therefore uh, support a much broader and exhaustive exploration of the design space. And finally, uh, the payoff of for these model-based systems engineering approach really comes into the picture, I think, once we consider uh, knowledge reuse. Actually, if I'm talking to industry, in, uh, the organizations that are implementing model-based systems engineering and that are using the systems modeling language, uh, they really notice that there is a return on investment only once they consider the use of their models over multiple design uh, iterations, multiple programs. Uh, it's really the, the reuse that makes this possible. And that requires then, of course, that we do some management of that knowledge that is stored in these models uh, by working with integrated model libraries. Okay. Chris? Yes? Can you like, clarify the report semantically rich? Semantically rich meaning, meaning that the, the models uh, are formulated in a formal modeling language where each of the different uh, model elements has a formal semantics associated with it. Uh, so, that it's, you know, people communicate using models by sketching out stuff on a piece of paper, uh, but those are not very informal, these semantics. And it works well if we can actually uh, talk about a diagram like that, because if there is any ambiguity or misunderstanding, then we can clarify while we're discussing it. Formal. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I thought maybe they something else, but somebody can respect to the Okay. Yeah, formal and, and rich is not quite the same thing. 
rich covers a broad spectrum of different uh, uh, aspects that can be modeled. Yeah. Okay. Ultimately, I think, and, and I feel strongly that we always need to keep this in mind, that uh, all of this is there to help us make better decisions. And uh, within the re my research group, we always try to go back and make sure that the, the, the ideas that we're working on fit well uh, with the decision theory uh, foundation. And so ultimately, you know, we're always looking at generating alternatives, comparing the, our predictions about the outcomes and then selecting the most preferred alternative uh, based on an expected utility. Uh, now, where model-based systems engineering comes in in this picture is that we can uh, improve the efficiency by performing the systems engineering process with fewer resources, automating some of the more mundane tasks, but it also must lead ultimately to better decisions with the available information. Uh, make sure that we are more consistent with the designer's beliefs and preferences. So if we only focus on the efficiency part, then I think we're really missing the, the ultimate payoff, which is to make sure that we make better decisions with the available information. Okay, it's part of the problem of capture of what the designer really means by this uh, Yes, what the designer really means, but also uh, making sure that when we use tools such as optimization, that we have actually formulated the mathematical problem in a fashion that reflects these, you know, the specification and the, ultimately the designer's preference. You don't buy a person by a certified That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the systems model in language, I'm going to skip over this part. Uh, everybody's familiar with it. The four pillars, both structure, behavior, uh, parametrics, and requirements but also how these different types of diagrams uh, can be tied together using these cross-cutting model elements, which is really the most important part from my perspective. They're not just separate views of the system, but they are all tied together in an integrated fashion so that we can express uh, the, the dependencies between these different views inside the system, system model language. What I'd like to focus on now is how the availability of such formal models in a system of language allows us to do things not only more efficiently, more efficiently, the things that we can currently do more efficiently, but new things that were previously just not possible. And within my research group, we are focusing on the use of model transformations as one way of uh, extracting information about from the system model and processing it in, in novel ways in order to uh, not only improve efficiency, but create capabilities that were not there previously. So let's look at what we mean by model transformation. The transformations that we're talking about are on the one hand, starting from the system, system model here, for instance, in the system of language at the left top, and generating a variety of different other representations of that system that can range from pure documents. I know that when I started off, I was saying, well, let's move away from documents. Let's move away from documents as the primary representation. But it's still, the document is a necessary capability in order to allow a human to interpret the information that is stored in the model. So from the model, which is kind of a network of information, it's, it's often necessary to generate a linear perspective of that model in a document. And we can do that using a transformation. We can transform the information in the model to uh, simulation and optimization representations for mathematical processing. Or you could actually use it to, to do project management. A manager would be very interested to know how many of the requirements have not yet been mapped to any structural, uh, represent, structural element in order to uh, satisfy that requirement. Or how many functions have not yet been allocated and so on and so forth. These kinds of metrics can be very helpful to a manager to manage the overall systems engineering process. Model transformation itself is actually a technology that comes out of the, the software engineering world. And uh, it actually follows the, the approach that is shown here at the top. Uh, model transformation occurs between two different languages. And the two different languages actually could be the same language. But 
both of these source and uh, target languages are represented by a meta model, and uh, the transformation is defined at this meta model level. So we're defining really what the transformation is in a declarative sense by relating model elements in the source and in the target uh, languages with each other. The nice part about uh, the tools that are currently available for model transformation is then that once such a model transformation has been defined in a declarative sense, it can be compiled into an executable form in a transformation engine that then can be used to perform the model transformation on the actual user model level. Okay, and uh, some of the tools that are available include Mothlon, UVT, ATL, GME Grade, uh, Viatra, Kermeta. These are mostly European tools, except uh, as some of us know here, the, the tool here from Vanderbilt, uh, GME Grade. Um, it comes out of the model-driven architecture, and some examples of how these model transformations could be used. Actually, in, in the software engineering community, originally these models were used for to go from model to text, model to code, to code generation in essence. But more and more, there's an emphasis on what we call model to model transformation, where we now take one model and generate another model. And these other models, in our case, for instance, could be Modelica. And this is one of the areas that, that, that uh, I work on within the object management group here, is to create a formal transformation specification between uh, SysML, or more precisely, a, a profile within SysML called SysML for Modelica, and the Modelica language. And uh, then the transformation between SysML for Modelica and the Modelica language uh, has been captured in a QVT transformation that serves as a normative uh, view for uh, the mapping as an OMG specification. Okay. So here we're going from one model in SysML for Modelica and transform it into another model in the Modelica language. Uh, another use of model transformations that we have developed within my group is uh, that of modeling, of transforming system model parametric diagrams into uh, model center models. Model, some, model center is a process integration framework. It allows you to integrate different simulation processes, uh, map inputs, uh, outputs from one process into inputs of another process, and then tie these together together with optimization and uh, maybe uncertainty analysis tools to uh, execute these models in an efficient fashion even in a distributed fashion, where you could execute the models on, a, on, on grid computing or cloud computing facilities. What we've done is taken a, created a model transformation that goes from parametric diagrams into a corresponding uh, a model center model, which is absolutely crucial in the context of model-based systems engineering because it's the capability that is necessary in order to make SysML models executable. SysML models themselves are actually just declarative models. They represent what the model is, but most SysML models do not allow you to execute. Most SysML tools do not allow you to execute these models. And by mapping them, uh, creating a transformation from SysML to Model Center, we can now execute these models. And from a black box perspective, include a variety of more complex models that are not easily represented in system number. MATLAB models, Excel models, those can be integrated uh, inside model center. Okay. So after this introduction here uh, on model transformations, what I would like to do now is spend a fair amount of time looking at uh, system architecture exploration and uh, how we are using uh, SysML language combined with model transformations in order to address the system architecture exploration problem. The overall approach is summarized in this diagram over here, and uh, I know that there's lots of lots of words on here, so I'm not going to go through the detail. I'll come back to it later. But what I would like to point out is two key features. One is from left to right, meaning that in the solution of uh, these 
architectural exploration problems or approaches not to jump immediately into the mathematical domain and model these problems in terms of mathematical representations, but to take on a higher level of abstraction and actually model the problem first and create a semantically rich representation for the model in SysML and then perform a transformation from that model description into a mathematical, a corresponding mathematical model. The second feature that I want to point out is from, not from left to right, but from top to bottom. And that is that we can do this transformation then from problem definition to problem uh, solution at different levels of abstraction. And the approach that we're taking deals with first uh, just system architecture exploration, then component sizing, and then a very detailed analysis that includes uncertainty and, and detailed and, uh, dynamic simulations. So we're working at different levels of abstraction, but always going first from problem formulation into a mathematical representation that, that can be solved efficiently using uh, existing mathematical tools. What kind of uncertainty you have currently? The uncertainty quantification uh, that we're using is just basically a lab hacker group sampling uh, uh, characterization of, of the uncertainty that we then combine it with uh, maximization of expected utility. Right, so you have people not uh, considered using uh, interval uh, arithmetic or set bounds for uncertainty quantification? Uh, actually, I strongly oppose those. Why? Because mathematically they're flawed. Uh, that the only the only acceptable representation of uncertainty is probability theory. Oh, no, no, no. But that, I'm, I'll be very happy to discuss that in more detail. Yeah. Uh, but the, like I've right. actually worked quite a bit on uh, imprecise probabilities and interval representation earlier in my career, and we've moved away that from that completely because mathematically they're not sound. All right, I look forward to a discussion on that topic. Okay. <laughs> Uh, let's see. So what I'd like to do is give you an illustration of how we are approaching this problem of first representing the problem in SysML and then mapping it to a corresponding mathematical representation. And I'm going to focus on some work that is done by my student Alec Kurtzner, one of my PhD students, that actually straddles these two levels somewhat. It does focus on system architecture, topology of the system, but involves already to some extent, the component sizing in order to guide the uh, analysis of the, the system topology. The example that I will be using is uh, that of the system architecture exploration of a hydraulic excavator. So uh, consider an excavator, but in, to, to focus the problem a little bit further, we will be focusing on just a hydraulic subsystem. Given some component models and some components for hydraulic subsystems, pumps, cylinders, accumulators, and so on and so forth, uh, and some objectives and preferences that we have about the performance of that system, uh, find that the best architecture integrated and coupled with that problem very strongly is the finding the best component parameters, and ultimately the best controller is also actually still very strongly coupled with that. But that's a problem that we have sidestepped for now. So let's, we're, we're, let's not worry about that. We're going to focus on these first two parts first. One important aspect of defining what the problem is, is actually providing the designers with the capability to identify what the set of potential solutions is, or the set of alternatives is, that they're willing to consider. Uh, you know, you could say, well, hydraulic systems, uh, I can come up with a library of all possible hydraulic components. Uh, I can just tell you, there you go, pick, pick and choose, put them together in whichever way you want to, and come up with the system architecture. If you open up the problem this broadly, even for a limited domain such as hydraulic systems, the complexity just goes through the roof. And we would really be ignoring much of the knowledge that uh, the engineer has, the designer has about the system. So our approach has been, let's provide the system engineer with an expressive language in which that person can express their knowledge about the domain in such a way that we can still uh, enumerate or identify what this, the space of alternatives is uh, without having to narrow down to 
uh, one specific uh, instance within that space. So, for a hydraulic system here, uh, the, the engineer could identify that for an excavator, we're going to need four different uh, cylinders and uh, a swing motor, and this is fixed. These are always there. But then we have some optional components. We could use valves, but we may not use valves. Uh, for hydraulic systems, there's actually impossible to use a, uh, a pump motor that is connected directly to a cylinder without the use of valves. And uh, we actually can gain potentially quite a bit of efficiency by avoiding the throttling losses in the valves. So we have some zero or four valves. We have one to four power units and one to four prime movers. Prime mover being a, a diesel engine, for instance, that actually provides the, uh, the, the energy to drive the overall system. This allows us to specify what are the different components that we want, want to consider, but we also need to identify what are the potential connections between these components. We could leave it wide open, but our preference is to actually provide as much guidance as, as we have available in order to uh, limit the complexity of the overall problem. So, uh, in kind of an n-squared matrix configuration, like you, some of you may be familiar with in, as is used in systems engineering, we can identify uh, what are some of the required and what are some of the optional components uh, that uh, what are some of the optional connections between components. So this allows us to specify what can be connected to what. Required, co required uh, connections are already shown here in the diagram itself, but then there's optional connections. Not all, everything is allowed though. It doesn't really make sense to have, let's say, the, the tank and the pump ports on the same valve directly connected to each other. So we will not allow those. Can you annotate the connections by references? Uh, we just treat them as optional or required, period. And you allow the system to pick. That's right. That's right. right. Actually, our experience has been that including such preferences is actually very difficult for the designer to express themselves. And uh, almost always is it such that a particular connection, if you ask, is, is this required, or how strongly is it required? Well, it depends. It depends on the context. It depends on the particular type of problem that we're solving. So we're just using three categories, not allowed, optional, or required. In SysML, we can also represent the requirements and do a requirements decomposition. Here is a, a simple subtree of, of the overall requirements tree. And what's different with the traditional uh, SysML approach is that we have made some of these requirements testable. And that means that we can associate with the requirement an actual test. A test really, from my perspective, is the best way to express more formally what that requirement really entails. If you say something like, oh, I want to minimize the fuel economy, well, what do you mean by that? Fuel economy under which conditions? Uh, what kind of uh, cycle or operation are you performing while we're considering the fuel economy of, of an excavator? By associating a test with, with that requirement, we can be more precise. And in SysML, in, in the way we define the problem, we uh, define these tests using two different types of diagrams. On the one hand, as is shown here on the right, we define the test setup, the physical structure really of the setup, uh, in, in a solution-independent fashion. So uh, for those who are not familiar with, with uh, SysML, whenever a block or a part here shows up in a, in a dashed outline, that basically means that there is just a, a reference to it, but it's not an actual part of the, of the uh, setup at this point. And, uh, that means that whenever we generate system alternatives that fit this top level description that we have previously defined, it can actually fit into this slot if you want to, so that the test can be defined independent of what the internals are of this system, high level system architecture perspective. In addition to the test setup, we also define a test protocol as an activity diagram in which we actually specify 
what the process is for performing the test. So in this case, we initialize the test, we check the fuel level, we start the boom, extend operation, and provide some parameters for that. We then do an arm extend, and we check the fuel level again in order to compute then how much fuel has been consumed in that particular operation. Simple example, but we can make this more complex, and with, with the, the expressivity of, of activity diagrams, we can do loops and so on and so forth to, to specify uh, uh, complex uh, decision scenarios, uh, complex test scenarios. In addition to the definition now of the problem, we also need to capture some of the domain knowledge. Uh, because ultimately what we would like to do is take the description of the problem and convert it into a mathematical description of that problem. So far, I've not shown any of the mathematical equations that are associated with any of these. Those need to be captured. And we do that in the model libraries, the main libraries, where what I've shown so far in the previous diagrams are these component structure models. Uh, but associated with those are models that describe the system from a variety of different perspectives and a variety of different of levels of abstraction. In this library here, we are dealing with linear and nonlinear models at the algebraic level. Some of them are cost models, uh, but some of them are behavioral models also. Behavioral models that capture just maybe steady state behavior of the, of the, of the system components, or dynamic behavior, as is shown in the system of Delica library on, on the right hand side. In addition to the model libraries in which the individual models are used, we also capture what we call correspondences. And the idea here is that as we reuse physical components, for instance a cylinder, then almost certainly in our system our model, a variety of other models need to be included that describe the cylinder from different perspectives, cost, reliability, dynamics, mass, and so on and so forth. And we need to make sure that we capture what the relationship is between these different models so that whenever we use a cylinder model, we can also instantiate these other models. There's patterns, in essence, that occur. Whenever you use a cylinder, the same pattern of models will reappear in your overall systems model. So you store the patterns then? We store, we store it in this form here. So what, what this shows is, um, here is a robot actuator and a corresponding Modelica model. And we use an association block in SysML to establish that there is a relationship. But the association block, I mean, we could have established the fact that there is a relationship using a regular association. But an association block allows us now to capture also the, the details of what that association entails. And so it could be that there is uh, an IBD here uh, capturing the relationship between substructure or we could also have a parametric diagram that allows us to map uh, parameter values between the structural model and the corresponding analysis model. So we basically then have, for every uh, correspondence, three libraries involved. The structural library, the analysis library, and the library of correspondences that tie these things together. We found that this approach with correspondences is the best way to make sure that the libraries do not start depending on each other. What we're really doing is that the Modelica library exists separately, that has been developed and can be maintained separately. The structural model library exists separately. The correspondences point in these directions, but they do not involve any references to the from between the libraries uh, directly. So the correspondences is the neutral representation in the middle that allows us to establish the these patterns are within the domain, right? Yes. Yeah. And so this is really where we're capturing the domain knowledge. And to be honest with you, this is where a lot of the work, and uh, this takes a fair amount of time to capture this and uh, maintain this. Uh, there's no magic involved, let's put it that way, right? We're not making up knowledge. The knowledge needs to be captured somehow, and then it can be applied. The nice part of working with uh, these types of correspondences also is that the transformations that need to be used in order to apply 
this correspondences into a real model can now become independent of the domain. We can actually uh, uh, define uh, correspondences like this for the mechanical domain, electrical domain, hydraulic domain, and the transformation rules that use these correspondences are the same for all of the domains. So it, it makes the knowledge uh, declarative in the library and not stored in these model transformations. Now, the last part here that I want to focus on is how what my student then is doing uh, is taking the system model that describes what the problem is together with the libraries and uh, he, he is writing a, a model transformation in essence that uh, will generate uh, CPLEX code in the AIMS tool. AIMS is the tool that we're using for mathematical uh, programming and uh, the, ultimately the solver that will be used to solve these equations is called CPLEX. CPLEX is a tool for solving mixed integer uh, linear programming problems. Uh, so linear programming, as you will see, we can support also a piecewise linear uh, equations and piecewise linear models. We have, to be honest with you, gone through quite a few different tools and different approaches, ranging from uh, design grammars and uh, how we can use grammatical rules to build up potential algebra, uh, potential system solutions uh, course, with corresponding models even. But uh, we found that a constraint-based approach is actually more convenient to express our knowledge in than a grammar-based approach. Uh, first, we looked at that constraint-based approaches that were purely uh, logical in nature and basically allowed us to express things in the first order logic and, and solve those using constraint satisfaction solvers. But really, in order to work in these physical systems, we have to include uh, algebraic equations at the very least. Differential equations, also desirable, but at this point, we only support those by, uh, by discretizing the differential equations over time and turn er everything into algebra. So when you say simplex here, you mean simplex proper or simplex integrated by the logic solver also? So can I do this just in a mixing the random optimization or also enhancing the constraint based solver from the law? That's not his idea. Uh, actually, that's a good question. Not the same, I, don't right? sure, I don't know the for sure the answer. But sometimes it's better to look at the constraint based yeah. way and then move to duplex. And in, in log and now IBM have this integrated now. So it's, it's available. The question yes. is how you formalize with this framework. We have, we have worked uh, within uh, the iLog tool, but uh, uh, basically we, we started using AIMS as, as an alternative yeah. rather than the IBM environment. The other question I have on this is when we did, we did this. Many yep. years ago, in the first time of my encounter with some problems, which were large, is, is the following. If you don't take precautions in the design of the system to end up with the integer part of the program, yep. you have a certain structure, then you end up with the impossibility of computation very often. I mean, many of the problems are undecidable. So, can you change the structure in such a way so that you can use in the integer part of the program something like the modularity of the property so that then you can actually know that the mixing is a program will work reasonably well, right? Because if it doesn't, yeah. uh, unfortunately the tool, this tool in particular, <laughs> does not give you any diagnostics back when you get into uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the dead end, except you know your frustration and the repeated yeah, use. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I'm just asking a very difficult question. If you got any since no. you obviously played a lot with it, if you have found any well, we have, we have played with a lot of solvers and have been frustrated multiple times it's already. Very good. Uh, so so we like this also. It's just a question of whether you have any insight about how you go after this I'll, kind of I'll show you how we are approaching the model, how we convert the physical model into um, yeah. the, the linear equations. I'll show that next. And then uh, you can give me feedback maybe on whether you think these, these different, uh, the approach that we're taking actually will result in a well-posed problem. And so far, the problem solved very quickly. Okay. Uh, but. Uh, I don't know for sure how well it will scale once we throw really large problems at it. I mean, I know it seems like it can handle millions of equations. We have not gone there. Um, if, I will explain now how we go through these equations in four different steps. 
Uh, the first step is to actually create a superstructure. The superstructure really uh, from the combines the, the two types of information that I presented previously, which are the components and what are the connections. And we actually instantiate all of the components and all of the connections. So it becomes a really large network of components, but ultimately not all of the connections will actually be instantiated. Here we actually we do show all of them. And uh, that allows them to go into the second step, which is to look inside the components. Once these we have identified what the components are and what the corresponding uh, algebraic models are. We actually go through a linearization of the constitutive equations. For instance, if we have a, a simple uh, torque speed curve for an engine, then we can linearize this. I'm showing only three, three segments here to, so that the equations don't become too complicated. But in the first step, uh, what you can, uh, uh, how you can approach this linearization is to, to define the, the three equations on top there, which really represent any point then inside this convex hull of these, of these points. Not exactly what we're looking for, because we would like to stay not on the, inside the convex hull, but right on the perimeter. And we can, we can accomplish that by adding a few more equations that actually show that we now need to choose one of these segments. And uh, as we choose a segment in terms of a binary variable, then we will actually stay on the perimeter of, of this convex hull. It seems relatively simple, right, to do just, oh, we can do a piecewise linear approximation, but to express this in terms of uh, mixed integer linear programming is non-trivial, and you, you really need to massage this a little bit to, to make it come out right. Did you try a linear problem when they were better to do an inner and an outer analysis? Uh, we have actually not done that at this point because we don't really care, to be honest with you, that we stay exactly within the feasible range. We, we just want to have an approximation so that what we can do is filter out the obviously poor solutions and limit ourselves to the most promising. Uh, if your approximation, when you go and you look at the actual specifications in a constraint setting, yeah. Uh, that he didn't overstate the problem, understate the problem, uh, or if the approximation pushed in the wrong direction, how do you judge that? Uh, at this point, we don't. Okay. But my perspective is that if we approximate the, the nonlinearities relatively closely, then it will drive us in, in, in the direction away from the obviously poor solutions. So it, 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 yeah. Is it because you can always go back to your test procedures and test it? Is it that why? Because you can say it. Well, 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 you must have some safety yes. part that says, I make an approximation, yeah. I come up with a solution with my mathematics and so that is feasible, and now let me go back. Yeah. Right? So what does that is in your system? So the way, the way we, we approach this, if I, the, the big framework that we showed earlier had three layers in it. This is just the first layer. Okay. And so basically what we're trying to do is eliminate many of the solutions that are obviously poor so that we can then take the, 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 the remaining ones on to the next layer. And if something happens in, in terms of approximation that, that was actually made, made that the optimal solution at the first level was not quite optimal, then that will be discovered in the, in the future follow-on layers. Yeah. Uh, in addition, we need to look at the generation of connection equations. And as we do in Modelica, for instance, we will generate equations that correspond to Kirchhoff's laws, meaning that we capture continuity of flow as well as uh, equality of potential. And uh, the challenge here is that not all of the equations are required, and so we would need to introduce uh, decision variables that shows that show whether uh, equation whether a particular connection is present, yes or no. And we can do this here by using maybe an exists a C Boolean variable, a binary variable that uh, uh, we could multiply then the, the flow portions that correspond to that connection by. But if we do it this way, then we end up with nonlinear equations. And so uh, basically CPLEX is no longer applicable then. You would have to go to a nonlinear solver. And I can, I can assure you, if you do this, the problem just becomes uh, practical for all intents and purposes practically unsolvable. What you need to do instead is reframe the problem uh, using you know, a big N approach in essence where uh, you bound the flows to be with, with two equations now 
uh, where if the, uh, the, a, the AC connection exists, then you're basically saying that the flow is between some large upper and lower bound. If it doesn't exist, then the upper and lower bounds get multiplied by zero, showing that the flow then also must be equal to zero. So it's kind of a, what we call a big M approach for specifying uh, these equations. And this is the tricky part again. You need to somehow formulate the problem in such a way that you stay within the linear programming paradigm. Uh, and uh, once you do that, then you can actually solve these problems quite efficiently. A relatively simple problem here uh, for a four-cylinder uh, hydraulic system that I was showing earlier. We haven't included very many operational phases or very many different uh, opt optimization criteria, but uh, it, this particular problem here ended up with a, a little over 7,000 uh, constraints and, and 2,100 variables, and within C Plex, it's solved in a little bit less than 10 minutes. How many quality constraints were there? Equality constraints? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I don't know exactly how many there were. Because those two zeros, if those are not connected, those will all eventually act as equality constraints. Basically. Yeah, if, if, if exists AC is false, then these two inequalities re result in one equality, yes. Because but we worked on a similar kind of thing in that some time was generating a lot of problems for us. Yes, the quality constraints in general are much more difficult to deal with than the inequality constraints. Uh, but with the so far, the large structure and the large flows which are not really active, you yeah. have to blow up the number of equality constraints for a bit. Uh, but every time yes. you don't have a flow, it just basically back to the result of equality constraints. Yes. But uh, at least this whole volume, we've not, we not had any problems with that. Uh, I mean, th this is a very simple equality constraint. If you have actually a functional relationship, to, like the one that I showed earlier here, uh, this type of equality, this also will result in equality constraint. This is a lot more cumbersome than, than just setting something to zero. Right? Th this, is, this can actually cause problems. Yeah. OK. So. So what? I mean, this is always the big question that I try to ask myself in, in the end. Uh, what, what, we're, what we've tried to accomplish here is, on the one hand, make it easier for systems engineers to express themselves in, in, in a particular domain. Right? We could have written all of these equations by hand and, and generated this CPLEX program by hand manually. But clearly, that is very limited in what you can accomplish. 7,000 equations is really pushing it for a person to start typing in. And uh, we really need to move our description of the problem to a higher level of abstraction. And that, to me, is, is really similar to what you would do in the Modelica language. Modelica did the same thing. It went and took the engineer away from the differential equations to higher level of abstractions so that we can express ourselves much more conveniently in the Modelica language and then crank out thousands and thousands of differential equations that can then be uh, manipulated efficiently. We're trying to do the same thing here, but not for simulation, but for design optimization in, in a certain way. Uh, so we can express multiple perspectives, multiple op operational phases, and uh, do so in multiple levels of abstraction even to specify these complex problems. Second key aspect, I think, is that we are transforming into declarative equations rather than into simulation models that have been coded in MATLAB, for instance, uh, so that once we have declared the equations, we can actually still do reasoning. In our case, we are not doing the reasoning, but CPLEX is. The fact that we provide CPLEX with these declarative equations uh, allows it to be more efficient in, in the solution to the problem. Uh, so this deals with both formulation and the solution, helps us uh, to define what the problem is in this declarative sense. Uh, we can also use the same problem definition at different levels of abstraction. This is something that we still need to uh, further explore. Because at some point, the problem definition itself also needs to be refined. And uh, at this point, the exploration that we have done so far allows us to define the problem once and for all uh, in, in a fashion that is independent of the solution and multiple levels of abstraction. 
ultimately, this may actually need, to, need further refinement from a research perspective. Keep in mind that our goal is not to find the optimal solution here. But are really, it's, this is only one step in the overall process. And we're trying to filter out the poor solutions so that we can then use more accurate models, more uh, computationally expensive models also, to do more detailed analysis and optimization in uh, subsequent phases. OK. Well, in the interest of time, I'm, let, let, let's summarize here. What I tried to do today is give you a sense for model-based systems engineering, uh, what it is, what kind of languages are, are uh, developed to support model-based systems engineering, and how we are using model-based systems engineering in, in conjunction with model transformations to solve uh, architecture exploration problems that I think are well beyond uh, what uh, people have been able to solve in the past and well beyond what is currently being handled in, uh, in, this, in industrial practice. So with that, thank you for your attention. So questions? Yeah, I have a question about the scope of this kind of approach. For example, in the first slides you showed this very broad scope yep. scenario where you know lots of different people with different interests are involved. And then the example, the engineering example, is a very closed scope, right? You're doing a very specific mm -hmm. engineering of a you know, so you would expect the people involved there uh, share a common language, have common interests, things like that. Where in the in the broader case you have groups that have maybe conflicting interests and lack of trust and and all of this, and so I, I, I'm interested in the kind of scope of these tools and how useful they are in, in, in environments where people don't have common language, common interests. Uh, Absolutely, that's a very good question. I mean, and I personally think within model-based systems engineering, yeah. this is where the, the, one of the significant challenges still lies. It's, it's very much a cultural aspect. Yeah. It, we cannot just change the way we represent the information, but we really yeah. need to change the organizational aspect that goes with it. How do people actually use these tools to communicate with each other? Uh, there's, there's definitely still need for further uh, work in that area. No way to the, the reason I ask is, I mean, it comes from experience, because I, uh, my years at at and I, I actually quite often worked as a consultant with business units on database integration. And they always had this problem. You know, three different databases representing essentially overlapping information. Management wants to integrate these databases to save costs and all, for all sorts of reasons. And yet, there are good reasons to keep these things separate, you know, and tight, loosely coupled rather than tightly coupled. You know, groups had different time scales of evaluation, different interests, different uh, you know, in other words, this unified, they all see this unified thing as creating a bottleneck. And they don't trust the other people. They don't trust the other organizations for not, you know, uh, introducing bottlenecks and problems for them. Except I don't think this will do that. So, but I think in a, in a, in a broad scope it, it can. In the narrow scope, I think it's not. But in the broad scope, when I showed this one yeah. uh, system model, yeah. it doesn't necessarily need to mean that there's one database, right? Yes, it yes. could be multiple databases that, that somehow, but they do need to be connected. If they're completely separate, then I think we will run into consistency, dependency problems, yeah, and the problems that ultimately will, will really kill you. Yeah. So the idea here is, people is, have is, 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 gone through the experience you had, yeah. including both of us, I think, and many others in the room, is that decouple and allow for interoperation, not necessarily within the same universal model. Uh -huh. okay. That's the emphasis. So yeah. if you want to use your own tool within this framework, okay, you I can see. do it. If you want to have it within a company integrating, you can do it. All right. This is the emphasis. I see. But, but, but I mean, there, there are some caveats there, to be honest with you, that still need to be further explored. If you still work within your tools, one perspective is that you could actually hide some of the details because maybe not all the details are relevant really at the systems level. But uh -huh. at what point uh, do 
there still exist dependencies at these lower levels. Some of the details that you have hidden, do they, these details now come back and haunt you? Yes. Because there are some dependencies that, that you didn't fully capture. Right. So yes. if it really means that everything needs to be uh, open and, and shared, yes. then we have a problem, I think. Yeah. Okay. You need to do, have some form of encapsulation and information hiding to make it work. It may actually be that, that you change the way you design the system yeah. to enforce this decomposition. So another thing that caused problems in the database world with these modeling tools was often you're, you're, you get stuck in a certain design and the requirements change and the world changes and you want to get over here, but it's very difficult to migrate. In other words, schema transformation yeah, is not yeah, supported yeah, yeah, well yeah. by any of the modeling tools. Yeah. So here what you want to do is you want to make sure that you have flexible ways of migrating or changing your basic assumptions and yeah. propagating those through. Is that heavy? I mean, maybe that fits into your transformation uh, uh, idea. Yeah, that's, that's beyond what the tools currently support. Right. Uh, I think even most of these tools that are being developed build on the software engineer community. And yeah. schema transformation is, is a hot topic even of research in that community. It really, we don't. It has been for thirty years. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we don't have that. We don't really have that resolved. Yeah. Uh, people are looking at higher order transformations where they're yeah. done, you know, creating transformations of the transformations. So that they're right. But it's it's not something that is available. And I'm not a computer science researcher, so I'm going to wait for this computer science to figure <laughs> out. To make it more difficult, you can schema transformation CSF with different states. That's different level, so I can see. Mark. Uh, so I have this nice paper that you're a co author on from about five or six years ago on four ontologies. Okay. And some yes. of the students in my class have been reading it and okay. playing it and stuff. And um, so, and I look at this and I'm like, no, wait a minute. Has um, has that got lost in the in, in, in the scheme of things, or could you use your poor ontologies to actually improve the efficiency with which some of these transformations would work, or to or reduce the, 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 the size of the design space? Well, actually, so it's not completely lost for the no, 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 no. It's really it's <laughs> weaved so, in there. It's just kind of stuffed yeah. in there. What, what, uh, I didn't, what I didn't show is that uh, at some point that I, I mentioned that there was a, a that there was a, a correspondence between models here, right? And it's this is where force somehow. really come into the picture also. Yeah. Is that uh, the way we think about structural components clearly has a port-based abstraction right. to physical components, but there's also similar port-based abstractions at, at the modeling level. Uh, the modelica language clearly is sport based, but uh, uh, the analysis models are likewise, uh, even though we deal with purely algebraic state, state models, then we also define those in a sport based perspective so that we can take advantage of this notion here of uh, having connections between ports and supporting the semantics of these connections in turn for describing those semantics in terms of uh, for cost loss. Right, but is there any opportunity for doing reasoning in the ontology level to say, hey, two of those equations don't apply, they don't even need to be considered? Um, and so, this, you know, if you're worried about your problem blowing up in the model transformation, you, when you see that the modality is just going to get them times 10, it's, yeah. it's going to become completely computationally practical. And the Modelica yeah, will, I don't, I don't think, extends to this, to this level. Here. No, no, if you don't, right, if you don't get into Modelica in a minimal fashion, you're dead. So from my perspective, Modelica can only come into the picture at this, at this bottom level. We really, mathematically, we change paradigms very significantly going from year to year. Here we're dealing with declarative equations that, that need to be considered simultaneously. Right. Here we go to black box simulations, right. Right. right? This is mathematically a completely different paradigm. So we have black optimizers, the traditional optimization approach of uh, tying an optimizer to a black box simulation. And at some level of complexity, that's where you, ha you have to go there ultimately because uh, just 
taking an entire modelica simulation and representing that whole simulation now in an equation-based fashion. That requires actually that you discretize over time and that you, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, 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 But maybe it transformation by itself is not enough. Maybe it should be transform minimized, transform minimized. Because you go back and forth. Yeah, but. I don't think he means that this one goes in one pass. No, I mean, he goes back and forth. I actually have one more, another of my PhD students yeah. is looking at this variable fidelity thing here, where we actually have estimates of the fidelity that is achieved at each level, and then you can make trade offs between the right. quality of the, right. the prediction and uh, uh, the how, how well is, is, this, is, this, is the model suited. To, so, if, if you're very far away from the optimum, then you don't need to know very accurately uh, how, how poor the solution is. You just reject it and move on to, to another solution at that, at that same level. Any other questions? I want to go back to this uncertainty modification. Yeah. Uh, so I want to clarify what I'm saying. So, and I see this this idea here. Okay. The way I think about uncertainty yeah. right, is, is a major, major problem of engineering because nothing is always just one or specified accurately. So there are two ways to handle uncertainty. One is by bounds and, and calculus of bounds and, and set calculus. Yeah. And the other is by probability. Yeah. There are two fundamental differences, right? To go to probability, yeah. you have to convince the questioner that if you have enough data to compute the actual probability model. If you have that, then the probability approach may give you an advantage because you actually give you the problem more information. But if you don't have that, the simple approach and the implements advances in this area is a better approach. Right? So I'm not talking about the probability in sets. The approach is very limited. Right? But uh, so my my perspective is that uh, from the decision making perspective, yeah. sets don't add any value. It, it doesn't really help you to make good decisions. The only thing that you can conclude by looking at sets is that you end up with multiple alternatives that are mutually uh, non-dominated. So you basically end up with a bunch of solutions that you can say, you know, if I were to rank them, well now we have sets and you say, well, they're overlapping. I cannot really say that this one is better than this one because you know the, ones, the true value could be at the bottom and be at the top, and therefore we can, they're mutually non-dominated, and we cannot we have to consider them. If we want to make a decision at that point based on sets, what do you do? You cannot make a decision. You can flip a coin and say, well, I'm just going to pick one of the non-dominated ones and then run with it. It doesn't really help you to make make good decisions. If you have probabilities, on the other hand. Then uh, even when when uh, the ranges of their probability, their PDFs in essence overlap, then uh, uh, utility theory still gives you a, a uh, criterion. A actually, it's, it's based on if you, if you accept the axioms of utility theory, then it's normative. There's only you can prove that there's only one way to make a rational decision, and that is to maximize the expected utility. So even when the ranges overlap, then utility theory tells you which which solution you Your should. Problem is logical, right? Yeah. You need to convince me that you can always compute probability models with that you have. It's very difficult. You don't need data to, to come up with probabilities. Probabilities are expressions of my subjective beliefs. And so uh, I don't need any data even in order to, to come up with probabilities. You can't Seriously? Say it? No, but then you validate. And the other, the no, most no, serious no, good. No, no, and, and, and trust me, any any use of data is there to inform my subjective belief. So it, it is even no matter how much data you have, it remains a subjective belief. But then if the you, other problem I run into this, right? Especially if I'm going to use the utility expected to maximization, is many of these problems are multi attribute utility, right? No, single attribute. Oh, I mean, you have so many variables and methods. Yes, yeah. but you have to. And then I was the only way. I was here and said that from observations, I cannot lose track in what they have to be That's a theorem. So, how am I going to go and do it? Right. Arrows and possibility theorem. Yeah. That yeah. replies to not, not multiple uh, criteria, it yeah. replies to multiple decision makers. Yeah. That you can. Yeah. That you have a voting scheme for multiple yeah. decision makers. You have a totally different yeah. problem. Anyway, that's a long story. Because I, I've, I've, I've gone through this whole books of the old Python system engineering, yeah. and I expected to do the maximization. 
And then they teach you these things in the beginnings, our impossibility terms and so on, they go and apply that yet. So I mean, it, it, it comes to this point, right? Yes, of course, I can always say this is my belief and I can make it happen. Yeah. But in a true engineering setup, how do you test this objectively <coughs> by experiments and variables and metrics and, and measurements, right? Because that's what they're all about. In the end, you have to go to the lab and say, if you make these measurements, yeah. whether I use bounds or probabilities, this is going to work. And I, here's why. Or go and do one million experiments, and if it doesn't work, we'll help you. So one part of the equation why I'm very strong about that is to what extent we can actually automate and by proof test and validate rather right? than sending all this to the problem and whenever to the test to the to the to the, to the, to the, to the laboratory and whenever it doesn't work we say well well this is one case we can predict. Well as we all know okay, we cannot prove anything. No. Oh, well. So uh, I mean anything that is based on scientific observations and that is based on scientific method, Hopper will tell you that you cannot prove anything. You can only uh, falsify things and yeah. If we try to improve, we, we, we're setting ourselves up for failure. So the only thing we can do is recognize the uncertainty that we're dealing with, take it into account, and make the best decision we can, given the uncertainty. And you look at here, and we'll tell you how to do that. Okay. On that note, <laughs> thank you very much. All right. Thank you.